604. If you haven't seen that, go see that in the summer. But this is a play that not a lot of people know about, and it is actually about this courthouse. So um, Cheyenne Townsend, right back there, is your director. And we hope you all enjoy the show. Please turn off your cell phones, too, please. So thank you very much. Enjoy the show. walks and enjoy the beautiful life that this scene lives. But not yet, and never As the evening darkness settles, the streetlights cast strange illusions of the bare limbs against the concrete walls of the courthouse itself. Though the walks by the courthouse will find a shortcut, those who have occasion to walk this way out walk quickly around the square instead. It is as if this square, in the center of the town of Bloomington in Burke County, is for the living during the day and for the dead. It is midnight on this comfortable, comfortable fall evening as the spirits begin to arrive in Courthouse Square. Some have been here before in time, but never have so many been here before at one time. A short time ago, before coming inside, these gentlemen, for instance, were observing the architectural de design and studying the sturdy, sturdy stone construction of the courthouse itself. This one, Confederate uniform, stood for a long time studying the monument and reading a list of Confederate dead. civilization possible. While Morganton was the capital of western North Carolina, it was the only town between Salisbury, 80 miles to the east, and the Pacific Ocean to the west. This was America's frontier, and here was the law and justice for what might have been called the southwestern United States. And here was something else. Here was one of the most noted attorneys in the United States, 
a man who had co-authored the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence and had served as the first attorney general in this new nation of North Carolina. Well, I was young, but I was a man, a man with a dream. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to protect the weak in this new American democracy from the strong and brutal life that was part of this American frontier. So I saddled my horse and I rode. I rode for civilization. I rode for Morganton. And as I rode, I dreamed. I dreamed of studying law with Mr. Waitstill Avery. <laughs> and as I rode over the mountain peaks and through the cool valleys, it was that dream that sustained me on that long, hard journey. And then I was here. At that point, I realized I, I hadn't even asked Mr. Avery if he would take me into his home and teach me. So, uh, for the, one of the few times in my life, I became unsure of myself. I rode first to the log courthouse, where this proud structure had not yet been built. And I tell you truly, one look at that symbol of justice and my courage and strength returned. So I rode out to Mr. Avery's house at Swan Ponds, where Mr. Avery graciously received me and graciously refused me. I left you, Mr. Waits Delivery, with a shattered dream, save one small hope. That 80 miles to the east lay another town, another chance. So once again I journeyed, this time to lawyer Bruce McKay in Salisbury. I have always regretted that I did not take you into my home, Mr. President, but I'm glad that Mr. McKay was able to do so. I watched with admiration your rise to the presidency, and I was generally pleased in spite of some of your more spirited moments. Are you speaking, sir, of our encounter in the courtroom? I am speaking, Mr. President, of your temper. Mm -hmm. That temper that caused you to take personal affront to my courtroom tactics. That temper that caused you to scribble a challenge to a duel in the middle of a court case that pitched us on opposing sides. Well, you had gone too far, sir. You who would not teach me the law and yet not lost not one chance to show before a judge how little of the law I knew. <clears throat> Time and again reaching for your beautifully bound copy of Bacon's abridgment of the law, and then quoting from it as if to say I was a frontier ignorance. Well, I said to myself, if Bacon means that much to him, then Bacon he shall have. <laughs> you were a proud man, Mr. President. Why then did you not realize that others possessed the same quality? For me, dignity and pride were one. You stripped me of my dignity, and therefore you injured my pride. Think back to that day. The court had resumed after a brief recess. I reached into my deerskin bag to pull out my copy of Bacon's abridgment to refute one of your statements. However, I pulled out not the book, but a greasy slab of bacon cut to the exact size of the book. <laughs> That's a good one! Get it! Bacon's abridgment! Slab of bacon! <laughs> that was the fire of youth, Mr. Avery. Time has taught me the necessity of controlling. Yes, I realized that after we'd exchanged words. But the challenge had been delivered, and the code of our day demanded that it be answered. Thank God we both realized that a moment of folly should not cost a life. I'm glad that we both listened to our seconds, and on that hill in Jonesboro, fired into the air rather than at each other. I would have hated to have deprived our nation of its seventh president. You really thought you could outshoot old Andy Jackson? You're not as bright as old Andy thought you could. <laughs> Their chores before court week. 
And us, we bring us a jug or two of our corn syrup for the occasion and camp out with the wagon campers at Morgan District Court. Morgantown had become known. It was a quiet town, all right. And it was the same lively place when I passed through on my way to represent the state of Tennessee in Congress. Was your first term as president, Mr. Jackson, and I was kind of anxious to get to Washington, but my timing was bad. <laughs> I passed through on court week. I tell y'all, Morgantown became a city on court week. There were peddlers from everywhere selling everything. There was a lot of swapping going on, too. A man came down with a wagon load of one thing and left with a wagon load of something else. People like old Wake still here who had a little money bought some of that high priced jewelry and furniture in Charleston and Hillsboro. We poor folks left with a little chaunt back in a jug or two. <laughs> so after a few days here, I was on my way with Washington to represent Tennessee. That was Tennessee severe, not Franklin. I caught your comment, Crockett. Let me remind you of something. It was I that made possible the state of Tennessee. across the mountains of what today is Tennessee. I knew the chances we were taking when we went to convention in 1784, where we declared the state of Franklin independent of the state of North Carolina. Did you know when you accepted the governorship of that rebellious territory that you would be charged with high treason against the state of North Carolina? I knew that the state of North Carolina did not give a good hoot about us. I knew we were isolated across the mountains, with no roads leading to the seat of government in New Bern. I knew that the Cher that our people were getting ma massacred by the Cherokees and the state of North Carolina, to whom we paid taxes, was doing nothing about it. You're avoiding my question, Severe. Did you know that you would be charged with high treason against the state of North Carolina, brought to the Morgantown Courthouse, and tried as a traitor? Of course I didn't know this. But something had to be done. And we did something about it. But I want to correct you on one point, sir. I've never been in a courthouse in Burke County. You mean that they didn't capture you and bring you to trial in the courthouse here in Morgantown? Well, I heard you made a daring escape through an open window. Those are lies that are made back through legend. I've never been here. They tried to bring me here. They thought they were being clever bringing me here instead of trying me in Jonesboro. Well, I even led a group of Mountain Patriots through here. On our way to the Battle of Kings Mountain, we even camped right, out right over there at Quaker Meadows. That's where we joined up with a bunch of Burke County Patriots under McDowell. We fought side by side with them, and we celebrated Burton on the way home. We, they forgot a lot of things, and we were reminding them. But the trial in the courthouse? I never made it to the courthouse. There just happened to be a horse that was accidentally waiting for me. I was galloping on my way home to the happy cheers of the Burke County citizens so that never knew what happened. But well, why'd you accept the governorship of Franklin, Sevier? You knew that the anger of the state government in North Carolina would be directed at you. Well, why did you go to Texas in 1836? Why did you stay at the Alamo when you knew it'd soon be overrun by the overwhelming forces of Santa Anna? I think I can answer those questions, Mr. Sevier. You were both Americans. You both saw abuses that were against everything in which you believed. You did what you had to do. I know that this part of the country is made up of this kind of people, so I came back here in 1835. I stood right here in this courthouse and told what was going on in Texas. I asked for help for the people of Texas against Mexico, and thank God I did not ask for money. Well, that's old Judge James Pickney Henderson. Yes, James Pickney Henderson, the person the people of Texas made their first governor after you, and the thousands of others like you made it possible for her to throw off the demanding shackles placed on her by Mexico and become a state. Why, that's right. The prison courthouse wasn't useful to them, wasn't it, Governor Henderson? This courthouse was just being built when I was here. I remember that they held a little rock by my cell window every day. Sheriff Boone, your great nephew, Mr. Boone, said that they were building a new courthouse. He said that the argument period was over and that the builders had decided to build this courthouse of stone instead of brick. There you go, line again, Francis Silver. The present courthouse was built by Robert Caldwell Pearson, Thomas George Walton, and myself, all here tonight. There was no arguing. We simply discussed the merits of stone over brick and decided it should be of stone. Come on, then, Avery. You know that both Walton and I wanted brick, but you win here. Isn't that right, Walton? That is an understatement. Avery, you had stone in your head, and Pearson and I could not hammer it out. <laughs> so we gave in, and stone it was. Though I admit, we were all pleased when we saw it completed. See, I told you.
told you to be a son. <laughs> yes, but we also would have liked it in brick. I bet you tossed in your grave when they smeared the plaster of those rocks in 1885, didn't you, Avery? I'll admit, I was angry at first. But when I saw it painted and shade trees planted, and I saw it standing in its quiet dignity in its own square, here in the heart of the town, I liked it. I prayed as I watched the work in the courthouse. I prayed that I would live to see it completed. What gives you the right to pray, Frank, sir? Now that I have heard of a more brutal murder than the one that you've committed. And yet you lift your voice to God? How dare you after what you have done? I prayed to a forgiving God, Sheriff Thurn. And as you put that rope around my neck, I prayed that you too would receive the blessing of his loving forgiveness. When I faced my judgment day, there were many things that I needed forgiveness for. But hanging you was not one of them. I remember vividly the evidence presented at your trial. I remember how the prosecutor told how you took an axe to your husband Charles and hit him in the head and continued to chop him up into pieces and put him in a fireplace to be burned. Stop! Please stop! Horrible though it was, it was not as heartless as the prosecutor made it appear. Bits of bone were found in your fireplace. The charred remains of the buckle of your husband's shoe, which you were unable to burn, we found up there by the spring. And big blotches of blood were found underneath the floorboards in front of your fireplace that you were unable to scrub away. And you say it wasn't as horrible as it sounds? You are guilty, Frankie Silver. And the child left doubts in mind of some because of lack of eyewitnesses. You're escaping of all doubts forever. Cool. Oh, I remember that day. You were walking behind your uncle's way. I admit that disguise was pretty good, too. That old trousers and that shirt and your head cut short looked like a little boy. <laughs> Something told me, Boom, could be her. So I called your name, Frankie Silver. And oh, you were a calm one. You looked up so innocently and understood, and I believed you when you said, What you need, sir? My name is Tommy. <laughs> you know, Frankie, you might have gotten away with it too, had one been for that dim old uncle of yours who yelled back, Yah, sure, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Please believe me when I say I was a victim of poor counsel. Never before had a woman been hanged in North Carolina, and since there were no eyewitnesses, my lawyer was sure I'd be set free. He asked that I remain quiet. I know now that if I had told the truth, I would not have hanged. Just what is the truth, Frankie? You have nothing to lose by telling it now. It was the worst outburst of drunken temper that I had ever seen. He was going to kill me, and I knew it. He was loading the gun, and in between the trembling caused by the temper and the slowing effects of the liquor, he was slow in loading. I had not planned to do it. In fact, I was shocked when I saw him lying there with a giant gash in his head. It was only then did I realize that I picked up an axe and struck him in the head with it. He was in such pain, but the next blow was a mercy. But then I panicked. Who would believe me, I thought. So from that point on, the story told by the prosecutor is true. Yes, I was here when they were building this courthouse. But the last day, the oxen did not come pulling their load of stone. Funny, but as I stood there on the scaffold, waiting for Sheriff Boone to put the roof around my neck, I saw that man in the great crowd. For some reason, he stood out to me, that I was surrounded by hundreds of people. I remember thinking, why are you not pulling your load of stone? Miss Silva, I too associate this courthouse with sorrow. But with me, there's pride in that sorrow. We're right outside this courthouse. I grasped my father's hands and said my goodbyes. I was a Confederate colonel and had been home for a few days before being transferred out to the Northern Lines. Though I pretended not to see them, there were proud tears in my father's eyes as his firm hand clasped served and said words as his goodbye. I let a group. I led a group of bird boys in that bloody charge of Cemetery Ridge as a part of Pickett's charge in the Battle of Gettysburg. A, vi uh, a lead ball found its vital spot in my neck, and I fell from my horse. Death came slowly. There was time to think. 
Time to remember those proud tears in my father's eyes. With that remembrance giving me life strength, I scribbled, Major, tell my father I died with my face to the enemy. I had no way of knowing that the Battle of Gettysburg was the beginning of the end of the Confederacy. I had no way of knowing that the day would soon be yours, General Gillum. Yes. I too remember your day, Gillum. I was in charge of the Burke County Home Guard. That is, if you can call a handful of boys and men like myself a home guard. That's all that was left when you got here in April of 1865. So you were in charge of the group that attempted to keep my men from crossing the river? I remember thinking what a brave but ignorant thing to attempt. Even after watching the rivers turn red with Yankee blood, I couldn't understand how so few were attempting to hold back so many. Maybe it was to give the people of Burke County time to have a little bit of happiness stealing the soldiers. Not that I had anything to steal. Just a few forced of clay pipes I made to sell here, and my old blind horse that I rode into town to sell my old pipes here at this courthouse square. What could either of you expect? How can you hope to make anything other than death and destruction out of war? My men had no supply line, so they lived off the land they conquered. But they were under orders to take only food and clothing. The rest was stolen by the hungry camp followers who swarmed in their country after my men had departed. I know that you're surprised to see me here tonight. Don't think that I haven't felt your angry glances. But when I heard that you were meeting to talk about saving the Burke County Courthouse, I had to come. Do you mean to finish what you started here, sir? When you set a torch to it in 1865? Though General Lee had surrendered, the war was still raging in the South by the time we made it to Burke County, Colonel. Can you tell those brave Union soldiers who were trying to cross the Catawba that you killed that there was no need to burn the court records because the war was about over? But today our nation is one again. And if you can put aside your bitterness towards me because of the past, we can fight this battle together. Is the general welcome in the Yes. 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 The cockscrow warns us that it's time to know. If you care to join us tomorrow night, General Gillum, you will be welcome. I think that we're all in agreement that when this courthouse is destroyed, a proud part of Burke County's heritage is destroyed with it. Bring with you tomorrow night plans that will change the minds of all who wish to destroy it. Oh, I got plans. I got plans for anybody who thinks about tearing down this courthouse.